Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, it's good to see you all tonight. Certainly appreciate you all being here. As you know, we're going to be looking at the different names of, uh, of Jesus. And uh, so one of the elders will take uh, each night that's going to be coming up. And I am going to be taking tonight. And we're going to be talking about Jesus, the Messiah. And uh, we'll have a lot of scripture that we're going to be going over. So hopefully have your, your Bibles ready and your fingers all warmed up because we will be looking at, at an awful lot of scripture. Um, before we get started, let's have a word of prayer. Our blessed Father in heaven, we are mindful of your goodness towards us. So far as things that are spiritual are concerned and physical is concerned as well. And we are so thankful to be able to be called your children and to have the blessings that uh, come through your son. We ask now that you might be with us in our study. Help us, Father, reflect, to reflect deeply on what it is that we're going to be learning tonight. We pray, Father, that it will give us a renewed zeal to, to do your will and to be more like your son. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Jesus, the Messiah. Um, the word Messiah is just a Hebrew word, and it means uh, anointed. And so when we talk about Jesus, the Messiah, you're, we're, what we're talking about is someone that was anointed to come to earth for a particular purpose, a specific reason. Now, what happens is, is that this this uh, revelation of this Messiah just happened in small little increments at a time. It was kind of a mystery. You like, you like a mystery? You like a good mystery? I like a good mystery. Whether it's a book or whether it's a movie, a TV show, uh, a mystery is, is, is intriguing, isn't it? Sheree and I are kind of hooked on this one television program called Blue Bloods. You ever, anybody seen that show? Yeah, Blue Bloods. It's a... Uh, it's a show about a family that uh, has a long tradition of law enforcement in New York City. And the title character, which is played by Tom Selleck, he is the police commissioner. <coughs> Excuse me. And he has uh, three children. Uh, one of them is Danny, who's uh, a field detective. And then they have um, Jamie, who is a, who's just a beat cop. And then he has a daughter, uh, and she's an assistant DA. And so what happens in this show is that you're introduced in the very beginning of some kind of event or some person, um, some type of activity, um, then, and, and there's very little information that you have at the beginning. But then as the show goes on, there's little pieces of information that you're given that will kind of help you kind of narrow things down. And so uh, for me, uh, I find myself kind of making some guesses in the middle of this thing, and I'm normally wrong, but uh, uh, they'll, they'll throw you a curveball kind of at, at the very end. And, uh, and so the point is, is that as the show progresses, the focus kind of narrows. And then finally, at the very end of it, uh, it's revealed. So the mystery that was is no longer a mystery because it's been revealed. The scheme of redemption with, with Jesus being the Messiah is kind of like that. And then at the very beginning, we're, giving a, we're given a very broad picture of something. And then as we move towards the Old Testament, that, that circle, that target, slowly starts to narrow down. And what we're going to be doing uh, tonight is we're going to be looking at several passages in the uh, Old Testament and then in the New Testament that, that reflect how this is narrowed down. We're going to be dividing this into two different categories. First of all, we're going to be looking at, at the foretelling of the Messiah, which happens all in the Old Testament. And then we're going to be looking at the fulfillment, which all happens in the New Testament. We want to start here, though, by turning to uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, because in, in this verse, it's kind of explained for us that that the whole idea of, of Christ and, 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 the, and the way that he came into the world and the purpose that he came into the world, to the people in the Old Testament, it was a mystery. If you look at uh, down in verse 7, Paul speaking here, he says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, 
the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory. So he specifically calls this thing a mystery. Well, why, why would it be a mystery to these people up until this point? Well, it's because they have not been revealed all of the information. And that's, that's the advantage that we have today, is that we can see the, the complete picture. We have Genesis to Revelation. We have uh, the revelations of the epistles and the, and the apostles. And it's been explained very, very, in very detail to us about how the whole thing works. You have to understand that back then, that's, that wasn't the case. These folks didn't have that advantage. And so they had these little pieces and, uh, of, of information. And what a lot of them did is they started making assumptions. And a lot of those assumptions wound up being, being incorrect. One of the biggest assumptions that they made is that, uh, is that this, this Messiah was going to come and was going to get rid of all of the Romans and they were going to reestablish the, the kingdom of Israel and it was going to be a physical kingdom in Jerusalem and, and this, this king was going to be able to get rid of all of the Romans and get rid of these people and uh, we're going to be able to have things the way that they were. That was one of the assumptions that they made, but that was because they only had certain kinds of information. And then we find out that even when, they, even when Jesus came on the scene, he died and he was crucified, he rose again. A lot of those people were so intent and stuck on their assumptions that they still thought that this, this Jesus, um, that, that this couldn't possi possibly be him because the, the Romans had him killed. Well, we had talked about the fact that a lot of times in a mystery, you're thrown a curveball, right? And there's something that happens at the very end that was just completely unexpected. Well, the story of Jesus as the Messiah, they got thrown a curveball. And isn't it interesting, and I think it's absolutely fascinating, that the very thing that, that the, the chief priest, that the Jews that were in charge, the very thing that they did to try to get rid of Jesus was the very thing that God used to fulfill all these prophecies. And to me, that is a fascinating thing. It's a, it's, it, 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 that's a definition of a curveball in my mind. And so when we, when we talk about this, we need to understand that we're looking at it from our viewpoint, having all the information, but these folks didn't have that. So we turn over now to uh, Colossians chapter 1, and we can find out here that, uh, that a lot of the information, all of the information really, has been... Uh, has been revealed through people like Paul. Look at Colossians chapter uh, one, and let's down, go down to verse um, um, 24. I now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ for the sake of his body, which is the church of which I became a minister according to the, to the stewardship from God, which was given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now get verse 26, and he says, the mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to the saints. So Paul was one of the ones that this mystery was, was revealed to. Turn over to the book of Ephesians chapter three, and we'll look at verse uh, one there in uh, chapter three. He says, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly all, uh, written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. All right, so what happened is, is that over the course of time, over the, all of the course of, of, of the Old Testament, Little clues were given along the way. It was still kind of a mystery. It was a mystery during the life of Jesus, and it wasn't until after Jesus rose from the dead and went back up into heaven that the mystery was completely revealed, and we have that now in the New Testament writings. So it's, it, it's easy for us to look back on the, on the Jewish people and, and say, well, you know, those people, they, they just didn't have it together. You have to understand that they only had certain, uh, certain information. Well, what is the uh, what is the uh, the references to the Old Testament so far as the uh, Messiah is concerned? What are they called? What do we generally call those? We call them what? 
I'm sorry? Messianic prophecies. Messianic prophecies. Um, and what we can do then is we can look at these messianic prophecies, and what we can do is we can see how all of these things fit neatly together, uh, and that's what we're going to kind of do uh, tonight. So what we can do is we can kind of look at this in a, kind of like an ABC. What we're going to be doing is we're going to looking at uh, the the ancestry of Jesus. We're going to be looking at the birth of Jesus the conception of Jesus, and the death of Jesus. So A, B, C, D, okay? Ancestry, birth, conception, and, and death. And when we look at these things, um, there is a foretelling in the Old Testament of all four of these categories. So what we'll do is we'll look at all four of these categories from a foretelling standpoint, then we'll go back and we'll look at all four of these categories in terms of a full, a fulfillment standpoint. The very first messianic prophecy that we come to is found in Genesis chapter 3, and I would encourage you to, uh, to look at that. And, uh, and we'll look down at verse, verse 15. Now, this is a conversation that God is having with, with Satan. And uh, after Satan deceives the woman and uh, they're thrown out of the, out of the garden, God says to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Well, now that's, that's some fairly general information, isn't it? This is a messianic prophecy, but there are basically three things that we can get out of this one verse. First of all, we can see that, that whoever this is going to be is going to be the seed of a woman, well, that could, be, that could be anybody, that they're going to be temporarily hurt or, or hindered. You can see there in, uh, where it says that you shall bruise his heel. That's what the, uh, the hindering is, is referring to. But then we're going to be ultimately victorious. That's uh, contained in the, in the phrase, he shall bruise your head. So these are the three pieces of information that we can get out of this first messianic uh, reference. So look at that as the first circle. This is the big generalized information that we get. Can't tell a whole lot from this, but uh, as, we go for, uh, as we go forward, what we're going to do is we're going to be narrowing that circle down. Um, let's, um, let's go ahead and we'll look at the next, at the next um, one, which is, cons which is in uh, Genesis chapter 12. And we'll... Get on over there. Before we, before we do that, let me just show you this, uh, this quote here. This is by Charles A. Briggs, who is a 19th century theologian. He says, thus we have in this fundamental prophecy explicitly a struggling, suffering, but finally victorious human race, and implicitly a struggling, suffering, and finally victorious son of a woman, a second Adam, the head of the race. In the Protoevangelium, now Protoevangelium is just a fancy word for the very first reference of a messianic uh, event. The Protoevangelium is a faithful miniature of the entire history of humanity, a struggling seed ever battling for ultimate victory until it is realized in the sublime victories of redemption. So that's what he, that's what he sees in Genesis chapter 3. So that we don't have any other messianic references prior to the flood. The next, the next one we find is in, uh, is in Genesis chapter 12. So let's all turn there in Genesis chapter 12. And um, this, is a, this is a passage that's, uh, that's familiar to all of us. Starting at verse 1, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family and from your, from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation, I will bless you, I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and in you all families of the earth will be blessed. So here we have the lineage of Abraham. So what's going on now is we have this, this big circle, seed of a woman, and now we're going to narrow it down just a little bit. It's going to come through Abraham. And that's what's going to happen here in, uh, in chapter 12. Now then we can go down a little bit further. Turn over to Genesis chapter 17. 
uh, let's see here, 1721, where he says, My covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this time next year. This is, uh, this is uh, revealed to Abraham that it's going to be through Isaac. Now, we all remember the story uh, about how Abraham and, uh, Abraham and Sarah got kind of tired on waiting on God for this promised son. And so they decided that they were going to help out God a little bit. And what did they do to make that happen? What's that? Speak up. Hagar, Hagar. And Hagar had a son by Abraham, and his name was Ishmael. That's right. Okay, so we find out then that, uh, that Abraham actually had a total of about eight sons. He had Ishmael, he had Isaac, and then after Sarah died, he married Keturah, and he had about six sons by Keturah. Well, of all of those sons, of those eight sons, uh, what we find out is that it's going to be Isaac. That's going to be the one through which this Messiah is, is going to be coming. So that's what he says there in, uh, in, in that. Let's look at uh, chapter 28. And we can go down here just a little bit farther. Chapter 28 and verse 14. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north and to the south. And in you and in your seed, all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now this is uh, going a little bit farther. Isaac had two sons and they were, they were who? Esau and Jacob. Esau was the older one. Jacob was the younger one. Uh, the prophecy said that the older will uh, submit to the younger. So it's actually Jacob then through which this, uh, this, this this Messiah would come. So we're so what we can see here is this circle starting to narrow down. You have seed of a woman, you have Abraham, you have Isaac, you have Jacob. All right. So from the lineage of, of Isaac is where it's going to uh, where it's going to come from. All right. Let's uh, let's go down a little bit further. And uh, lots of verses in uh, in uh, in Genesis here. Let's look at Genesis chapter twenty five. Um, Genesis chapter 25 and verse 23. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two people should be separated from your body. Uh, one people should be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. That has reference to, to Jacob and Esau. But all of these things are prophecies, are messianic prophecies. Let's go ahead and look at this other one in, uh, in, in uh, verse 28, or chapter 28. And uh, there you have Jacob specifically being talked to and, uh, and saying that all of this is going to happen through your seed. So as we, as we continue to go through this, we just kind of need to keep in mind that it's all, it's all geared towards narrowing the circle down. So what these people have written for them is just little slices of information that they're having, that they're having to build on. Um, finally, then, let's look at, uh, let's go all the way back over to uh, Genesis chapter uh, 49. Let's go back over there and we're going to look and we're going to see that this circle is going to be narrowed down just a little bit more. Chapter 49 and verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah. This is Jacob and he's talking to all of his sons here and he's giving them all their blessings and all this. And uh, in verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, not a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes and to him shall be the obedience of the people. So this, again, is a messianic reference to, to the lineage. So of all of the sons of Jacob, it was going to be Judah through which this Messiah was going to come. And then we can look uh, a little bit further, and we can look at, and we're not going to look at all of these passages. I would like to look at a couple of them. Let's look at, uh, at 2 Samuel chapter 7. And because there are, there are lots of generations that that passed between, between Jacob and, uh, and, and, uh, and David. So we're, we're, we don't have all of that written in the Old Testament. We, we do reference it in the New Testament here briefly, which we'll get to. But here in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 7 and in verse 16, 
and your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne shall be uh, established. Now, this is information that, uh, that David was getting through Nathan the prophet. And so Nathan, was, Nathan the prophet was told this by God. Nathan revealed this to David. And he said, here, it's going to be your house and your kingdom that's going to be established uh, forever. Now turn over to Psalm chapter um, 89, and there's a little bit more information here that uh, we can glean from this. It kind of helps us uh, understand this a little bit better. Verses 3 and 4 in Psalm 89, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David. Your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. So... As we can see here, as we're moving through all of these passages of Scripture, we can see that this circle is starting to tighten a little bit more and a little bit more. And so we're not going to look at all of these other ones. Um, Isaiah 9 is, is, is interesting, but in the interest of time, we're, we're just going to move ahead here. All right, so that is the foretelling of the ancestry of the Messiah. Now then, let's look at the foretelling of the birth and to that, what we'll do is we're going to go all the way down to the book of uh, Micah. And so uh, turn over to Micah chapter 5. And I would say that, and this is, this is kind of speculation on my part, but all of these messianic prophecies, they're happening over such a long period of time, coming from different people. Many of them, most of them, didn't even know each other. Uh, and so when you're dealing with hundreds of years and every time there's dropped a piece of information, um, you, would, you would think that there would be some inconsistencies if this wasn't divinely um, inspired. Um, how many, how many well, I mean, what's the chances of this happening, of all of this being able to fit and dovetail together when it's given to these people over the course of hundreds of years? Well, the chances are, are, are pretty slim. And so... To my mind, um, you know, and I've been asked this question uh, before, why, why did God take such a long period of time to reveal all this information? Why didn't he just do it all at once? Well, I can't really answer that with, with any degree of certainty, but it seems to me like it adds credibility to the whole scheme of redemption when you're dealing with multiple people over multiple generations that were just given small pieces of information, and then it all comes together in the end. It seems to me like that just kind of helps the credibility of that. But look at Micah chapter 5. And um, what we find here is that, um, is that we find uh, that the prophet Micah is foretelling where the birth of the Messiah is going to happen. Uh, look at... Uh, Look at verse 2. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth me, the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from the old and from everlasting. Well, that's a fairly specific prophecy there. You know, there were, there were hundreds of towns and villages in, uh, in Israel and in Judah. And and what this prophet is saying, this one little tiny town just a little bit north of Jerusalem, uh, that's going to be the place where the Messiah is going to be born. And uh, what, what's, what's interesting is that there are actually two Bethlehems. There's one way up in Galilee, and there's one down um, towards Jerusalem. And what he's, what he's doing is he's narrowing it down to which one of the Bethlehems he's talking about, this, uh, this, this one in Judah here. And so we can see here that um, things are getting, things are getting pretty, pretty specific here. Um, and so it's, it, it, it's interesting that, that 700 years before the birth of Christ, this prophet is telling people this is where the Messiah is going to be born. Well, just think about that for a minute. 700 years. I mean, that is a long time to make that prediction and then for it to, to come true. All right, let's look at uh, the conception of Jesus. And to that, let's turn over to Isaiah again, uh, chapter 7. Told you we we're going to be looking at a lot of scriptures here, and so we're, and we're, not, we're not done yet. Isaiah chapter 7. So the question here is, 
is this Messiah going to be conceived in the natural way of things? The way that you and I are conceived, the way that, that, that our children were conceived. We were all pretty much conceived the same way. Well, there was going to be something very unique about the conception of the Christ. Look at chapter 7, and we'll look at verse 14. He says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. All right, so there are several things there that are listed for us. First of all, this, this Messiah is going to be born of a virgin. Again, hundreds of years before it actually happened. But yet, he's very specific about the nature of the conception. He goes on and he even says what his name's going to be. So all of this stuff together, all of this information together, you know, it's just fascinating to me that all of this came true at the very end without any contradiction, without anything being left out. Everything was given just the way it was foretold here in the Old Testament. So his conception was, was not going to be typical. There was going to be something very special and unique about it. And that is, is, that, is that he was going to come as a result of, uh, of being born of a virgin. So this happened hundreds of years before, before Jesus and, uh, and when Isaiah uh, prophesied this. All right, let's, uh, let's go on here a little bit. And uh, we'll, we'll look at the, the death of Jesus or the death of the Messiah. And here there are, there are several things here that we can look at uh, because the, the, death of, the death of the Messiah is probably prophesied as a, as a subject more than almost any of the other three. More than the uh, ancestry, more than the, uh, the birth, and more than the conception. There's just a lot of things that are, uh, that are contained for us. Uh, in the Old Testament so far as the nature of the death of, of the Messiah. Look at uh, Psalm 41. And we're going to look at, uh, we're going to look at several of these here. Um, Psalm 41 and verse 9. Even my own familiar friend whom I trusted, who ate my bread, he lifted up his heel against me. Well, who is he talking about there? Who is he, who is he prophesying of, about? Who was it that Jesus initially thought was his friend that eventually turned on him? Judas. Judas. Well, isn't it interesting that the psalmist way back there predicted that whoever was going to, uh, was going to betray him was going to be thought of as a friend. Uh, look at Psalm 22. And um, we can say, we say there that his hands and his feet were going to be we're going to be pierced, uh, Psalm 22, down to verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. Well, what happened when Jesus was crucified? What did they pierce? They pierced his hands and his feet. He was nailed to a cross. Again, all of these things happen hundreds of years. Uh, we can read on down, look at verse uh, 18. He says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Well, we remember that. Uh, that's exactly what happened when, uh, when Jesus was crucified. Uh, the people that were doing the crucifixion, they, 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 they took his garments, and they, they cast lots to see who was going to get them. Um, so this, this, is, this information, which we're going to be looking at here in a little bit in the New Testament, this was not written just for our general information. These things are prophecies fulfilled. And all of this builds credibility as to who the Messiah was and, uh, and, and his abilities and that he came actually from God. Now, one of the most uh, important chapters in the Old Testament is found in Isaiah chapter 52 and Isaiah chapter 53. Let's turn over there a little bit. And there's uh, some information here that we're going to be looking, and I know that I'm skipping through uh, some of this, but Isaiah 52 and 53. This is a chapter that probably most of us are, are, are very familiar with because there is so much contained in these two verses that have to do with the, with the, the, with the crucifixion of Jesus, with the trial of Jesus, how he didn't open his mouth, um, and... Uh, and so let's just look at a, just a couple of these things here. Let's look at uh, uh, 53 verse 7. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. So he, he, he went willingly. And uh, just like a lamb to the slaughter, you know, lambs, they don't really know what's going on. They're, they're not, they're not going to fight this. And Jesus didn't fight this. And so he, he went there willingly. Uh, and the analogy of a lamb, I think, fits very well with the attitude that Jesus had so far as being led to his, to his crucifixion. Uh, look at uh, chapter 53 and verse 9. And they made his grave with the wicked but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Well, this, uh, he was buried among the rich. Well, you remember the, uh, the story of Joseph of Arimathea? After Jesus was crucified, he was hung on the cross, and it says specifically that, er, that uh, Joseph was a wealthy man. We'll look at that here in just a minute when we talk about the fulfillment. And then uh, let's look back again at Psalm chapter 16, and we're going to talk about the resurrection here. Uh, just a little bit. John chapter 16 and look at verse 10. He says, For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. So once Jesus was in the grave, did he stay in the grave? No. He, he was risen. His body was risen uh, after three days. Again, a messianic reference here that uh, God was not going to allow him to stay in the grave. He's not going to allow his body to see corruption. All of these things were written uh, generations and hundreds of years um, before the actual events took place. So those, those basically are the, uh, well, let's look at this one uh, quote here. It says, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he hid, as it were, our faces from him, and he despised. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he was borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Now that should have been very confusing information to the people that it was written to at that time. What, is, what does all this mean? By his stripes we are healed. Well, we know what that means today, but those people back then with only uh, certain bits of information, all of this was just really fuzzy and, con and confusing to them. They, they started to formulate this idea uh, of, of what the Messiah was and who it was and what he was going to do, but, uh, but we'll find out that uh, here in just a minute that the, that, the, that the final realization of this wasn't anything really close to what they probably thought it was going to be. All right, so now then, one, uh, now that we've covered the, the, uh, the foretelling or the, the prophecy about that, what we're going to do now is we're going we're to move uh, to the New Testament and we're going to see the fulfillment of these things. So just keep in mind these four categories, the, the, uh, the ancestry, the birth, the conception, and the death. And so what we'll do is we're going to look at the fulfillment of all these things. So first of all, let's turn over to uh, Luke chapter 3. And uh, there are two, there are two uh, places in the New Testament that specifically talk about the genealogy of Jesus. And what we can find here in Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 23, and we're not going to read all this, going all the way down to uh, verse 38. Pardon me? Chicken. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, well, what's, what's interesting is that we see... Um, we see lots of generations between, between uh, these, these people. And a lot of these people, we don't, we're not told anything about them in the, uh, in the, in the Old Testament. We're just kind of given the highlights. But every one of the people that we are uh, introduced to in the Old Testament are listed here in, uh, in, in Luke chapter 3. And it's the same thing if you go to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew begins his gospel uh, with the with this phrase, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, uh, the son of, of Abraham. So what we can see here is the genealogy. Keep in mind that this already happened. Jesus was already here, and this is the lineage, and the Jews were well known for keeping track of their, of their genealogies and all that. And so all this was written down just exactly like 
it was doled out in the Old Testament over the course of, of hundreds of years. So the, the fulfillment of the ancestry is without question. Exact, it is exactly the way the prophets, the prophets had said. And our time is really getting away here. Um, let's look at the fulfillment of the birth. Uh, Luke chapter 2. Go over there to Luke chapter 2. And uh, we find, uh, remember uh, what, you remember what uh, Micah the prophet, what did he say about the birth of where Jesus was going to be born? In Bethlehem. Okay, so we have Joseph and Mary who are actually in Nazareth. Um, they were uh, obligated to go down because of the census to go down to, to their hometown, which was Bethlehem, and to, uh, and to register for this census that, uh, that the Romans uh, had said you have to do. So um, if you look there at, uh, well, let's look at chapter 2, and we'll just start verse 1 there. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all of the world should be registered. The census first took place while... Uh, Quirinius, the governor of Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone into his own city. So, so the, the city of Bethlehem was Joseph and Mary's hometown. So they were obligated to go to that town in order to do the registering. Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judah to the city of David. It's interesting that the city of David here is, is, is referencing Bethlehem, not Jerusalem which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David. So there again verifies that Joseph was of that lineage. He was to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. What does that bell mean? That's the downstairs class. Okay, all right. So I still, have, I still have some time. Okay. All right, good. All right, so we find that uh, uh, the, the, the prophecy of, of Micah chapter 5 is, is fulfilled here. Uh, it's, it's, it's just interesting that, okay, that all of this kind of happened. Mary and Joseph were not, at the time, they were not residents of Bethlehem. They were residents of Nazareth. And so it was... You would think that here she is with child, that the chances are that, that Jesus was going to be born in Nazareth. But due to these events, uh, the, the, the census that was obligated to them by, by the Romans, they had to make this travel time, and they were probably only there a few days to do this registering. And it's at that time that she gave birth in Bethlehem, just like the prophet said. So, so the fulfillment here is, is, is just fascinating. Um, Let's go on a little bit further here. Let's look at the, at the conception. Um, in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, now the birth of Jesus was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And even Mary herself, and we could look at other verses that says this, but she says, you know, I've never known a man. Um, I've, I, I've never... I've never done what, it need, what, what, what is required to have a child. So how can this be? Well, this is exactly what the prophets in the Old Testament had said was going to happen. Um, look, at, uh, look at Luke, uh, verse, Luke chapter 1. Uh, let's look at verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed of a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among all women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and, and bring forth a son and call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And in verse 34, this is when Mary says, I, I don't understand how this is going to happen. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, 
and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So here we have this, uh, this, this beautiful story about Jesus that's being born of a virgin, just like it was, uh, it was predicted 700 years prior to this. And, uh, and there is uh, ample... There, there's ample proof of, of, of all of this in the different Gospels that this is exactly what happened. Let's look at the final uh, fulfillment here, which is the death of, uh, the death of, of Jesus. Turn over to uh, the book of Matthew. Matthew 24. And uh, if you can think back on uh, when we were talking about the, uh, the prophecies of this, we looked at several of these things. That, uh, that, that predicted this years and years before. And um, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 24, let's look at verse 14. I'm sorry. Is it 26? Then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they said, counted out to him, 30 pieces of silver. And from that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. That same thing was, was predicted way back in, uh, in, in, the, in the Old Testament prophets. If you, we, we could look at all of these things, but his hands and his feet were, were pierced. That's found in John 20. Garments were divided. We talked about that. That's found in John 19. Bones would not be broken. Um, the brutal beatings and the, the, the specifics of that. Uh, he opened not his mouth and, um, in, in Isaiah 53. Buried among the rich. We can, we can go ahead and look at that one. Um, Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. Now when, evening, now when the evening had come, there came a rich man from Arimathea. The rich man... See, you can see how that's, that plays into that. The rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus. This man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a large stone against the, t- the door of the tomb and departed. The, all this was predicted hundreds of years before it actually happened. They said he's going to be buried in a rich man's tomb, and that's exactly what happened. Um, re- the resurrection. Let's look, at the, let's look at the resurrection because that's, that, that, should, that should really nail it for any skeptics um, in, in my mind. But uh, it said that in the Old Testament, it said that, uh, that God is not going to allow his body to stay in Sheol and that his body would not see corruption. And that was, that was, the, uh, that was the foretelling. If you, look at, uh, if you look at Matthew chapter 28, let's look at verse uh, 5. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. And he said, Come see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran to bring disciples his word. And then we find that Jesus appeared to them. So his resurrection was foretold years ago, and we could look at all of these scriptures and see that that's exactly that's exactly what happened. Um, we're, we're running out of time here, so let's, let's look at the, at the conclusions of, of this. Um, I think Ben uh, referenced this particular scripture in his, in his sermon this morning, uh, Luke chapter 4. And uh, what we're looking at here is the fact that Jesus himself looked, uh, to, looked for ways to, to, to draw in what the prophets had said about him and said, look, this is talking about me. And uh, this is one of these situations where I would like to have been in, in, in attendance here. Um, if you look at, uh, look at verse 16, Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Talking about Jesus here, it says, So he came to Nazareth 
where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are opposed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And all of the eyes, and the eyes of all of them in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture was fulfilled in your hearing. That to me would have been a fascinating thing to witness. Is that here Jesus, he, he, he comes into the synagogue, and you know, these people knew him, you know, he was raised there, and uh, he's handed this scroll, which was an Isaiah, and he reads this, and he folds it back up gives it to the attendant, and he sits down, and it says all the eyes were looking at him. There was, there's something about the way Jesus, his, his aura, his demeanor, his personality, there was something about Jesus that demanded attention. And it's interesting because he goes and he sits down, and everybody's looking at him. And then he says, what I just read to you is talking about me. That would have been a very, very powerful moment. And so all of these Old Testament scriptures uh, have been have been fulfilled. Um, we're going to be uh, we're going to be running out of, out of time here in a lot of these. Let's just look at um, let's look at a couple more here. Um, skip that one. We'll look at the Book of Acts. Let's see, go back here. Acts two. Let's look at Acts chapter two. This is Peter, and he's talking. Look at verse uh, 22. Men of Israel, this is Peter talking. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. Him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, and you've crucified him and put him to death, whom God raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So there's a whole sermon there that, uh, that, that he talks about. And uh, skip down to verse 36, where he says, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So I talked at the beginning about the fact that uh, you know, a good mystery sometimes has a hook, has a little uh, curveball thrown at you. And when Jesus came on the scene, he was just this lowly carpenter. He didn't fit the category or the, or the description of what they thought this great king should be. They thought he was going to be some great guy riding in on a white horse and all that, and he was going to be able to sweep all the Romans out of the way and restore Israel and so that uh, they were going to be able to live in the glory days. That wasn't what they got. they got. They got Jesus, who was just a lowly carpenter, and then they killed him. Let's get rid of this guy. He's just, he's just a big troublemaker. Let's just get rid of him. And so that's what they did. And to me, the curveball is the fact that they used, that God used the very thing that that the, uh, the Pharisees and the chief priests, he used the very event that they, that they used to try to get rid of him. God used that to bring the, all of this to fulfillment. And that is a fascinating thing. Um, and I don't think a Hollywood writer could have come up with something as, as, uh, as interesting as, as that. So I don't know if, how much you've, you've thought about that, but there is just so much uh, in the, the Old Testament and the New Testament that has to do with, with, with the Messiah and uh, in his foretelling and all of the prophecies that, that, came, uh, that came about. And then we could look at all of these scriptures to, uh, to find out that every one of these was fulfilled. Um, I'm going to skip ahead here to just a couple more things here. Uh, there's some examples in the epistles, and if, and if any of you want uh, any of these PowerPoint slides, this all came as a big package, I'd be happy to give those to you. Um, let's see here. What are the odds? 
mathematician Peter Stoner estimated that the odds of one person accidentally fulfilling just eight of the hundreds of Old Testament prophecies regarding to the Messiah. Well, before I tell you the answer, how, you know about how many prophecies there were in the Old Testament? Messianic prophecies? 456. All right, and what this mathematician is doing is he's saying the chances of one person accidentally fulfilling just eight of them, just eight of these, one in 10 to the 17th power. That's 10 followed by 17 zeros. Think of the odds of that. So we truly serve an omnipotent and a wonderful God in heaven that allowed this great scheme of redemption to, uh, to, be, to be given to us. And it's a wonderful thing that we have the complete book of the Bible that, that, uh, that reveals to us from the, from the beginning to the end. And we can see the entire picture. And sometimes we'll, we'll say, well, we're, you know, we're viewing this from the 30,000 foot level because we can see the whole picture. A lot of these people couldn't see that. And, and we need to appreciate the fact that they were just given pieces and parts of this information and they were left to speculate so much. And so we're not able, we don't, we don't have to do that. We can see it all. All right, so I know I've done all the talking here, but does anybody have any questions or anything like that? That uh, Yes, the little boy in the back. I have a question, but this is an illustration with that statistic that you just cited. Yeah. That number, 10 to the 17th power, if you took that number and you had a quarter for every, every one of those, you have a stack of quarters, mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay? Now, take one quarter, paint it pink, blue, red, and find that one quarter in the whole stack. And that's what... That's the odds. That's eight. That's the, the odds. Prophecy. Okay. All right. Well, that, that does kind of put it in perspective for you. So hopefully you've, you've come away with this with a better understanding, a fresher understanding of, of just how... Uh, how it is that God made all of this happen from the very beginning to the very end and how he controlled the process. He manipulated the process. He manipulated what people wanted to do to make it work uh, within this great scheme of redemption. So I appreciate your attention today. And, uh, and if you want any of this, just let me know and I'll make sure that uh, it gets emailed to you.